are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Driving is the leading cause of death for people under the age of 20. Your greatest risk of having a crash is in the first six months of getting your license. I'm Sarah Connor, and you're watching Life in Style with Sarah. On tonight's show, we're going to be talking about the dangers of teen driving and what parents can do to reduce those risks. My guest is Tim Hollister. He is the author of Not So Fast, Parenting Teens Through the Dangers of Driving. Tim, welcome. Before we talk about what's in the book, could you share with us the, the story of how you got to a place where you learned everything you did that you put in the book and have become an advocate for better parenting of teen drivers? Sure. My son Reed, 17 years old, uh, died in a one-car crash on Interstate 84 in Plainville, Connecticut in 2006. About seven or eight months later, Connecticut had back-to-back -back multiple fatality crashes, one in Bristol one in Walcott that killed seven teens. And at that point, Governor Rell said enough is enough, and she appointed a task force to overhaul our then very lenient teen driver law, and she appointed me as a parent. Serving on that task force, I got a re-education in the dangers of teen driving. I learned that I really had not been a well-informed parent in the year that I supervised my son's driving. But serving on that task force, I came to a couple of conclusions. One is that most of the literature that's available to parents says that their teens will start driving on day one that they're eligible, their 16th birthday, mm -hmm. that a parent's only job is to teach a teen how to drive a car, but what the literature doesn't do is teach parents why teen driving is so dangerous and most importantly, what they can do day by day before their teens get behind the wheel to prevent the very predictable and most dangerous situations from happening in the first place. So that became my focus, and in 2009, I started my national blog for parents, which is called From Reed's Dad, and then a few years later, I took the best of my blog posts and turned it into what is now Not So Fast. So that's five years and a few sentences. Mm -hmm. And when, when you talk about this task force and the new laws, these are known as graduated Correct. driving laws, right? Correct. Correct. And when we were learning how to drive, there was... Those, they didn't exist. They I mean, you basically, you signed up, you got your permit, Correct. you learned how to drive, you were, passed your test, off you went. Correct. And most of us didn't think anything of it, really, right? Well, well yes, except there were thousands and thousands of, tens of thousands of fatalities and right. a lot of serious crashes. For all the same reasons that, that you learned when you were on the task force. Exactly. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about, um, well, actually, let's back up. So you said you, you learned a lot. So at, when Reed was driving, did, were there warning signs? Did you feel like he was a capable, competent driver? Um, when well, you look back, what, what do you think maybe could have been done differently? Or? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't beat myself up over the night of his particular drive, and I, I can go through the details of, of his particular crash. But um, I learned that, as you said, teen driving is the, the greatest uh, cause of both injury and death for, for teen drivers. But... I learned about the fact that the human brain is not fully developed until we reach about our mid-twenties, and that is a characteristic of teen drivers that parents just have to deal with. Is they can, their student can be a, or their son or daughter can be a straight-A student, a Boy mm -hmm. Scout, Girl Scout, could have hours and hours behind the wheel in training. It doesn't speed up their brain development, I and mean, that's something I didn't know anything about. Yeah. A lot of parents didn't because it's a relatively new science. Um, the you know redrove crash free for 11 months and as he drove longer and longer without a crash I let the my wife and I let the tether out and gave him more freedom but that is really kind of a, a, a singular point about my education 
which is that your teen can be driving crash free. That doesn't mean that he's now, he or she has now crossed the line into being a safe driver. That actually takes several years and mm -hmm. based on the brain development really takes until they're in their mid 20s. That is my, my mantra, which I talk about in the book, is there is no such thing as a safe teen driver. There right. are no shortcuts to get there. So, yeah, so talk a little bit about the, the experience aspect of it. What is it? So the things that we do as drivers, that as a new driver, it just it, it takes time to develop. The, yeah. the skills that take time to develop. What yeah. are those things that just, it, it's a matter of time. The yeah, brain well, has to develop, and then they need to learn other things. Yeah, one thing that's very well shown in the research now is that new, new drivers look at the perimeter of the car. Their mm -hmm. goal is to not hit anything. And so they don't look down the road at the developing traffic situation, which is how you avoid a crash. You see the situation that's developing, you take action appropriately to avoid a crash or, or getting into a difficult situation. Uh, another example is that we train our teen drivers on local familiar streets, usually in compact cars at the, of the driving school, and then we let them drive an SUV or, or a high performance vehicle or a light truck uh, into, the mass, uh, into Boston on the Mass Pike. New drivers are learning to navigate and to drive at the same time. Think of yourself as a, an adult. You go to a new city, you rent a car, you're looking up at the street signs trying to figure out where to go. New okay. drivers are learning to do that and how to drive at the same time. It's a monumental task that we as, as older and experienced drivers, it's hard to think back at yes. how difficult that was at the time. As I was reading your book, which um, I was telling you before we started taping, just has really consumed a lot of my my uh, my brain power over the last um, few weeks. It's so powerful and I don't have children that are driving yet. I have a 14 year old so we, we know it's coming and I think I would advise anybody to read this well before your kids are yes. even close to driving because there's so much well, groundwork that you can lay. Right. And there's a lot about being a passenger of other drivers right. which is a, a real problem. Which is important yeah. and I, you know my husband and I have had so many many conversations and I was telling the story of when I learned how to drive my parents were very protective I never drove, I don't think I drove on a highway till I was 20 probably and when I finally did I didn't know when you get in, into the highway, when you merge into the traffic, you have to be going at highway <laughs> speed. You can't pull out That's and right. be on, you know, on ramp speed. And I'm thinking that was so dangerous that I just, and those are exact, the exact type of things you're talking about. Exactly. Just things that take experience and time. A and you let the tether out in small, very small increments. Mm -hmm. It's actually probably a very good practice that you didn't drive on a highway until you had a couple of years of mm -hmm. driving experience under your belt. And I was lucky because I had a friend in the car, yeah. which I know generally is not necessarily the best thing, but she knew, she was like, you have to speed up or yeah. someone's going to hit you. Right. You know, it was not, it was not a good thing. Yeah. Um, so your situation is it was not unique. It was horribly tragic and, and I hate hearing stories about things like that happening. Um, but like you said, it's not unique. Uh, lots no. of, lots of accidents happen. There are fatalities, there are injuries. Um, so as you've been out in the community, how have, um, what types of reactions have you been getting to your book and your, your philosophy um, of parenting? I, I think one of the biggest things that I was shocked about was some parents pushing back on what you're, ta what you're recommending. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, it's been very gratifying. Uh, the, the reaction to the book has been uh, a very positive, and I think what I feel best about is parents have validated my feeling that I didn't write the book to just regurgitate things that are out there and available in other forms. I really tried to hit a, a segment of parent education that just can't be found anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And each chapter in the book is intended to be something that is not available in the literature. And the I always say the book is really me doing homework for parents that they could do themselves if they wanted to spend years and years, but I've done it for them and tried to put it together in one uh, accessible resource. And I, I think the, um, I think the, as we were talking about before we, we started the show, uh, parents tell me that it has made them reflect on their own driving because being a role model is a very, very important part of bringing up a teen driver. Um, I talk in the chapter about distracting electronics, that if, you're, uh, if you have a dashboard mounted screen that allows you to update your Facebook page while you're driving, you're gonna have a hard time telling your teen not to text because you're basically doing the right. same thing or, or, or mm -hmm. something worse. So um, the, 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 uh, the reaction to the book has been, has been terrific. Um, it's starting to get some, some national attention, which is even, uh, even more gratifying. And uh, as I think many people know, the 
proceeds of the book are not going to me. They're going to my son's memorial fund, which is part of the endowment of the Asylum Hill Church uh, in Hartford, and also some several national traffic safety programs. So mm -hmm. we're, we're doing well and we're doing good at the same time. That's great. That's great. Um, you're also going to be um, talking more in depth about tips and, and specifics um, at Conard High School. Yes. On April 29th, the Community of Concern is going to have an event at Conard High School, and you're going to be the keynote speaker, and there'll be lots of opportunity. I'm sure as people are watching, they're thinking, I want to ask a specific question. They'll have yeah. a chance to that, ask you. That's, that's one of the real questions. goals, is to have a Q&A at mm -hmm. the end of my talk. There are things that can't change about teen drivers. So the brain development, you can't change. Right. Um, the amount of time that they've been driving, you can't change. It just it, it is what it is. Right. Um, why we have these graduated driving laws? Why are they? I think some people think, well, that's enough. I mean, and before I started reading the, your material, I thought, well, gosh, the rules are so much stricter than when I was a kid. That has right. to be great, but it's really not enough. Why is it not enough? Well, the graduated driver laws are a very positive step because they let teens drive little by little uh, into the most dangerous situations. For example, passengers. In Connecticut now, we don't allow teens to have non-family members as passengers until they've been driving for one year. Why? Because the overwhelming evidence is each passenger adds a significant level of crash risk. So we, we let them, we make sure that they have a year under their belt before they pile their friends into the car. And there are other aspects of night driving, the, the night curfews and, uh, and the, um, you know, the, the minimum uh, hours that you have to have behind the wheel before you can even get you apply for your driver's license and so forth. But graduated driver's licensing is a necessary step to prevent those most dangerous situations from happening. But by no uh, stretch of the imagination is a 16 or 17 year old who has driven for two years under the GDL system a safe driver because of the brain development, because there's still a lot of experience that they still don't have. Um, if they're now 18 years old and they're piling their friends in the car, that's now a very dangerous situation that, right. that parents need to, uh, need to be attuned to. So, um, you know, GDL is much safer than just giving them an unrestricted license. It doesn't create a safe teen driver. And that's the point that I make about driver's ed. Driver's ed is essential, but it's not sufficient to create a teen driver. Kids need to know how to drive a car. They need to know the rules of the road. But when you graduate from driver's ed, you are a beginner at a very dangerous undertaking. You're not a safe driver. And one of your chapters um, is called, But My Child is Responsible. Oh, But My Kid but is Responsible. But My Kid is Responsible. <laughs> and I probably would have been one of those parents before reading this, before learning all of this about the brain development, et cetera, because I have a daughter who's very diligent, does, yes. you know, is so on task and just so conscientious. But that doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, I always say the key word in that sentence is kid. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, yeah. they're just, it doesn't matter how responsible they no, are. That's true. It's still, they haven't had the experience. Yeah. No. There's so much involved in safe driving. Part of it is just time. So if they're a kid, they're not a safe driver. And what about, um, so passengers are one of the biggest risks. Yes. Um, there's some argument about uh, kids driving their siblings, teen, teens driving their siblings, that that might be a good exception. Yeah. Is well, it? No, it's not a good exception. The, the exception comes about because most of the graduated driver laws allow, sibling, allow teen drivers to carry siblings earlier than non-family members. In Connecticut, after six months, you can drive your siblings, and then it's a year for your other friends. Now, is this based on any evidence that carrying a sibling is, is safer than other passengers? Absolutely not. In fact, who is your son or daughter most likely to have an argument with while driving? It's probably brother or sister. Mm -hmm. My friend Dave Preusser, who's a, a very prominent traffic safety uh, researcher, says, do you really want to entrust your most precious cargo to your least experienced driver? Yeah. And that's a really good point because it's very convenient. Uh, mom and dad have been getting up at 6.30 in the morning to take so-and-so to school, but now they have a teen driver who can do that. But it is unquestionably a bad idea because teen drivers with passengers, that's where you get the peer pressure, the risk taking, the misconduct. They've got to show little brother and little sister what they can do with the car, but that's not where you want your family to be. Right. Um, and. Uh you had, there's something that you just mentioned, the, um, oh, the convenience. You talk yes. a lot about that. As parents, convenience should not be a factor. Correct. Ex explain yeah, I, that. Well, I, I tell parents, the, the, the mindset is that when you have a new driver in the house, it is so convenient. You have another mm -hmm. 
chauffeur, you have a pickup and delivery service, but rule number one for parents is don't put your own convenience ahead of your teen driver's safety. Safety has to come first. And, and if uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is, is uh, acting like an air traffic controller. Uh, every time your teen gets behind the wheel, you go through the safety checklist. If you use that as your mindset, convenience will not be at the top of your list. It'll be at the bottom or even off the list. So that, that's a good way to think about what's the right attitude is air traffic controller. The car doesn't leave until you, the control tower, says, okay, we've been through the, all the safety checklists. You're good to go. Right. And you have some of those things. I do. The things to cover in the book. And right. um, the other thing that goes along with that is each decision to let your child drive is a day-to-day -day uh, decision. It's, it's, it's not, oh, you have your license, go for it. Right. It's every day. Th there's, a, there's a way of thinking among parents that the teen gets the license after going through the state's test and driver's ed, and now the parent steps aside. That is absolutely the wrong thing to do. You need to stay involved, especially in that, in that first year, with every single drive. And w w one example of that is fatigue mm -hmm. is the hardest thing for a parent to kind of keep their finger on. The son or daughter's been up all night writing a paper or something like that. Do you want to give them the keys to drive to school the next morning? Well, that's something you need to think about. So you don't step back. You really get more involved when more they involved. when they start driving solo than at any other point in the process. Okay. So there are a lot more, a lot, lot, lot more details in your book about steps, things to think about. Each chapter is a great little nugget of, of information and um, recommendations. We have two parents who are part of the community of concern who are sponsoring the event on April 29th at Conard, if I didn't mention that. Um, and so we're going to bring them on and have a kind of a roundtable discussion with they have new drivers and their perspective on yeah. what they're seeing out there. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back with some new guests. We have joining us now um, two parents who are coordinating the Conard event through the Community of Concern. We have Karen Hammond. She is the mother of Kelsey, who is a junior in high school, and Ann Carn Ann Carney, who has a junior in high school as well. Right. Okay. So um, the story that I was told was that Karen, you read this book and you're like, oh my gosh, we have to do something with this material. All on fire about it. You called Ann. You said we need to do this. So what? What? got you on fire about this book? <laughs> um, well, uh, my daughter turned 16 last September, uh, the same time that this book came out, and my mom and dad actually had heard Tim on NPR and bought me this book and said, oh, maybe you'll want to read this. Um, and so as we were just approaching that stage of life, I did sit and read this book and thought, wow, uh, you know, this makes so much sense. This speaks to everything that I've sort of been reading or thinking, it's great guidance going into this. So mm -hmm. that's what got me excited about it. And Anne, what are your reactions or what rang true for you in the book? Um, Karen, my son started driving a little bit before Karen's daughter, he turned uh, 16 in July. Okay. And I, so I had not read the book when he started driving. He started driving pretty much right away. Um, he's a very... Um, cautious, um, careful, planned kind of child anyway. But, um, you know, Karen, when the book came out, Karen brought me a copy and said, you have to read this. And I was so glad that I did. He was, you know, had taken driver's ed and, you know, done all of the right things. But um, I think it was that it, it allowed me to know that it was okay for me to be the boss and for me to say no and to ask questions and to be the decision maker about whether this was going to happen. So it kind of gave you confidence that there are really good sound reasons mm -hmm. why it's okay to make your teenager angry when you question, My question their flight plan in exactly. the car. Exactly. <laughs> My favorite chapter was the one you mentioned um, about the flight plan because, and, the, and I have done that. And how does it go? How oh, does it makes it work? them mad. Yeah. And see, that's the thing that they think that, you know, it's nice to sort of have the parent reaction in there because it sounds, you know, you read it and you go, oh, yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. But then you're talking to your 16-year-old who wants to go and say, you know, well, how are, how are you going to get there? What, what, di how, what direction are you going to go? Mom, I know how to get there. 
No. Okay. So do you wait until he's done being angry and you get through your flight plan before you give him the yeah. keys? I see. Yeah. If, you know, I just will say, if you want, that's part of the condition of driving the car now. If you want to take the car and go there, you need to tell me and answer my questions. Mm -hmm. Now, something also, Tim, that you talk about in the book is, you know, there are these rules. There's the passenger rule. There's the graduated driving license uh, laws. Um, but the, uh, what am I trying to say? Enforcing them is a whole other thing because police can't be everywhere on every corner, and it's really up to parents in the community. Right. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, and then you can give your perspective on how you think parents are enforcing those graduated driving laws? Mm -hmm. Well, I think among parents in general, the enforcement levels are all over the lot. There are parents who, like, like Ann and Karen, have sort of learned, maybe with a little help from my book, and, and are now doing the right mm -hmm. things. Unfortunately, there's a lot of parents who think our teen driving laws are stupid. Uh, and uh, then there were the ones who have been to the two-hour State of Connecticut required safety class who may have gone in either not knowing or not caring and come out maybe a little more educated that may, well, maybe this is really mm -hmm. dangerous and I should pay attention and I should, I should learn. And you know, besides my book, there's lots of ways to get that education. I, I try to make the book an easy way to do mm -hmm. that. But, and it is easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, Anne said uh, something I've heard a lot from parents, and again, very gratified to hear it, which is it empowers parents to say no, which is sort of an overused word. But if you're going to enforce it, you have to be willing to take the steps, say the things that are going to restrain your overeager teenager from getting in the car and just driving off, and then you have to be willing to deal with the anger, at, which, as we know, with many teens is not real anger. It's, it's a reaction, but yeah. they're really secretly uh, glad that, that mom and dad are putting the restraints on them because they probably are a little scared themselves. Right. Uh, but um, you know, but that's, that's a very common reaction. And what about, do you think that um, one of the things that seems to be possibly an issue is, is the after school, you know, driving, giving a friend a ride home even though they aren't legally allowed to do it. It's just down the block, it's okay. Mm -hmm. they're, part of the, they're like part of the family. Do you see that kind of being an issue, something to be more aware of? Mm -hmm. And you don't know if, the, if your child is doing right. that or not. One of the things that you mentioned in the book is that actually the, the most dangerous time of day for right teen drivers school. is right after school. Right. And I have been thinking about that and at times that I have been at the high school at the end of the day for whatever reason, just really paying attention to what is going on in that parking lot. And it's a little crazy. Mm -hmm. And these are great kids mm -hmm. and they're smart and they're responsible and they are not intending to do wrong. But they're kids. But, but they're jumping kids. in the car for fast food or something. Sure. Or, the movies or, or there's, whatever. you know, sure, yeah. I'll give you a ride. Or mm -hmm. we're really busy checking our phone and getting organized and laughing with the friends as we're driving out of the parking lot where mm -hmm. there's 50 other cars driving out right now. Yep. Right. So it's, I, th I thought that was very interesting. And the summer. Because there's a difference between, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time, but if we can squeeze in the difference between purposeful driving and joy riding, because yeah. that seems to be a big deal. Yeah, that, that, when I bring this up, it's kind of an aha moment for parents. Purposeful driving is when your teen has a reason to get to a place on time. If they don't, they'll have a consequence. So going to a job, a school activity, um, you know, anything that in the community that's, that's purposeful, they're going to get there because they're going to drive slowly and carefully. It's the joy riding, mm -hmm. teens in the car for fun. That's when we see the risk taking, the peer pressure, the misconduct. And that's why we see the spike in teen driver crashes. We saw it here in Connecticut in the middle of 2013, mm -hmm. where you have multiple teens in a car out for fun. That's where you get the, the misconduct and the peer pressure. Mm -hmm. So again, the book is not so fast. Parenting your teens to the dangers of driving, it is dangerous. There's no safe teen driver, and this is, there are lots and lots and lots of things we didn't cover in the book um, tonight that help parents to navigate and make it safer for their teens. Don't forget to go to Conard High School on April 29th. The Community of Concern is hosting an event. Tim is the keynote speaker. I think it's sponsored by Avon Driving School. Um, it's, there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask your own questions, things specifically about your teen. The book will be available. My goal for the show is to have everybody pick up a copy of this book, whether your child is 14 or 18. Learn what Tim has learned um, and head over to Conard on April 29th.
Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tim. Thank Thanks you. for sharing your story. My Thank pleasure. you for this book. I feel like I'm, I'm less scared to have my daughter start getting her license in a couple of years. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for mm -hmm. Anne. Thank you for having us. You. You've been watching Life in Style with Sarah. I'm Sarah Connor. Don't forget to tune in next month to a brand new episode.